disease, hunger, pediatric cancer, and vision. Um, so today we're going to be focusing on the environment and um, we're happy to have Angie of the Washington Conservation District launch our lecture series. Um, she's going to be doing a presentation about landscaping for wildlife. Um, before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit about um, Washington Conservation District and Angie. So the Washington Conservation District enhances, protects, and preserves the natural resources of Washington County through conservation projects and educational services. Um, they've been providing expertise on water quality, erosion control, and natural resources since 1942. Within the Washington Conservation District, Angie is an education specialist. She coordinates the East Metro Water Resource Education Program. And that includes public outreach, coordinating workshops and activities for Blue Thumb, planting for clean water, and conducting stormwater U professional training. In her free time, Angie enjoys singing, competing in triathlons, and exploring the prairies, woods, and waterways of the St. <laughs> Croix Valley. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Angie. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Anne. Um, and I was so lucky I had the pleasure of getting to go and tour Anne's farm on Monday and met her daughter, Olivia, and uh, saw all of the native plantings that Olivia has just done all around their property and heard about the bird habitat project that she's been working on in Scandia and Marina and St. Croix May Township. So that was that was really fun and exciting. Um, I have missed getting to see people in person this year, and it's always really inspiring when you see these young people like Olivia that are just so motivated and such go-getters. Um, so I am going to go ahead and mute folks and turn on my screen and talk a bit about planting for wildlife, and I'm going to highlight uh, kind of the whole gamut of wildlife, uh, birds, insects, um, you know, frogs and turtles, and then talk about some of the kinds of projects that we most often work with people on. And I am outside and it's not a virtual screen. I am outside in the backyard. So my apologies if there's suddenly random, you know, bird noises or dogs barking in the backyard. Hopefully it will be, it will be quiet enough that you'll be able to hear me throughout the time. So, um, Let's see, I will go ahead and mute everyone. And I will start sharing my screen now. Okay, uh, so carrying on. Um, some of the topics that I will be talking about, basics of landscaping for wildlife, I already told you the kinds of animals that I'll uh, talk about in more specificity. And then at the very end, definitely wanted to mention the free site visits and grants that are available through both the Conservation District and the local watershed districts. Um, Anne already did a really good introduction, so I don't have much to add there, but I do have my contact information. And one of the things that I've been doing this year since uh, so much of our stuff has gone virtual is recording a lot of videos and doing short educational things uh, that are being posted onto YouTube and TikTok and Instagram. So you can find me, or if you have young people in your lives, you can recommend them to find me there as well. Uh, so Washington Conservation District, it's local government celebrated its 75th anniversary just a couple of years ago. We're pretty small. We have 15 staff people and uh, we work all over Washington County and do stuff in partnership with the local communities, with the watershed districts. Uh, we do get a lot of state grants that are for specific projects. Um, we do water monitoring on around 80 lakes and 44 streams around the county and then help private landowners with habitat projects, whether it's a tiny little pollinator friendly garden in a front yard or a huge farm or, you know, somebody who's converting an acre of old farm field to prairie. Uh, we do kind of the whole range of scale of projects. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with the idea of watershed districts. 
And in Washington County, we actually have eight different watershed management areas. And these are special local purpose uh, governments that are created around an area where all of the water drains to the same place. So for example, up in Scandia, you, if you are in the north end of town, you fall into this Comfort Lake Forest Lake Watershed District, which means that the water is probably going to Bone Lake, eventually going over to Forest Lake. And it is connected to the St. Croix River, but it goes up north through Chisago County before it makes it to the river. Um, if you're down in the south part of town, then you'd be in the Kearney and the Marine St. Croix Watershed District. And that has the big lakes, um, you know, Big Marine, Square Lake, Big Carnelian, and all the water from there also goes to the St. Croix River. Uh, but the thing to know if you don't already know is that the watershed districts, they do have cost share grants for projects. Um, they do a lot of large projects on their own and they also have rules that, um, that kind of regulate how development happens. So that if somebody's developing a shoreline parcel, for example, they do it in a way that prevents erosion and protects the lake while they're developing. So your yard, as it currently is, probably falls someplace on the spectrum. I, I imagine that nobody here lives in example number one, the castle. Um, however, a lot of people do have a lawn that looks like this. It's kind of interesting. The history of lawns is that they were developed in you know, 17th, 18th century Europe when only the very most wealthy people had them because they could hire, you know, people who cut them with, you know, scissors and, and, and um, oh, what do you call those things? You know what I'm talking about, but they, they were cutting them by hand. Um, and it was also a way that you could see, you know, the marauding intruders that were coming from some outlying region. Uh, so nowadays we don't, really have those available resources, most of us um, end up having to take care of lawns on our own, probably don't have marauding invaders coming into our yards. Uh, kind of that next step up, uh, some people like to maintain the look of a lawn, but just incorporate some flowering species that provide pollinator uh, nectar. So that's something we're look, doing a lot of now is um, these bee-friendly lawns. If you look at example number three, that is showing like a really lush, lovely native garden. This is probably the most popular kind of project that we work with people on when they're planting a rain garden, a shoreline planting, a native garden, and they want it to look, you know, really pretty, have lots of colorful flowers, but also have good species that attract birds and butterflies. Uh, and then finally, example number four, this is more like a natural habitat. And we do actually have a lot of parcels in Washington County where people still have chunks of unadulterated habitat and we work with people to maintain the habitat or to restore habitat if uh, it's been converted to farmland over time. Um, so the basic things, you know, if you go way back in time to grade school, the basic things that wildlife need, food, water, shelter, space. Uh, I think that when people think about creating wildlife habitat, they think about the food, um, but they don't always remember these other components. And one that really frequently gets forgotten uh, is having the shelter for the wildlife. Um, so if you're somebody who has a big property, it's okay to leave these dead balls, this woody debris that falls down, because that does create a lot of really good habitat for small mammals for birds, for um, reptiles and amphibians when they're hibernating during the winter time. Uh, and the same thing happens along shoreline properties that, um, you know, a lot of times when people purchase land on a lake, they kind of take that suburban lawn mentality to the edge of the water and they think, oh, I need to make it look really tidy. I need to clean up that shoreline. And that's not really what you want to do. Uh, you want to have these fallen logs, you want to have these little bits of emergent vegetation. It helps to slow down the waves, helps to prevent erosion, and it also provides really valuable habitat for fish and frogs and birds. So speaking of birds, this is where it gets interactive. Um, those of you who have been using Zoom for a while now, you know that there should be a, the little chat feature or you could just real quick turn on your microphone. In a moment, I'm gonna share some 
bird sounds and see how good you are at guessing the bird sounds. Uh, in the St. Croix Valley, they estimate that there's about 320 species of birds, 60 of which are considered species of greatest conservation need. Uh, and some of these special ones that are less common, some of the species of greatest conservation need include this little loggerhead shrike, uh, the red-headed woodpecker, red-shouldered hawk, and the wood thrush. Okay, did I, oh, I would be so sad if I took out the, if I took out the guessing sounds. Um, we'll, we'll have to find out if I, if I maybe took out the guessing sounds. Um, for people who are out in your yard zone, you're hearing noises and you're wondering, well, what on earth, you know, can I figure out what kind of bird that is? Um, there are a couple of different cool tools that you can use. One, this bird genie, you can download this to your phone. And then if you're hearing a bird in your yard, you can record it and, you know, put it into this app and it will guess what kind of bird it is that you're hearing to help you identify. And um, the other one that I listed on here, it's called an identifier. And this one is uh, like you get a little, a little gizmo and it's got cards that you put in there and you can push on the button for like a goldfinch and hear what the goldfinch sounds like. Um, they also have cards for frogs. So you can listen to um, different bird songs and different frog songs to kind of familiarize yourself with what they sound like and um, help you identify them when you're out hiking. Okay, I guess I I might not have um, I might not have done it the secret way. Hey, maybe I maybe I did it for the frogs. I did it the secret way. I swore that I had the the sound so you could try to guess which kind of one it was. Um, well, I've got a picture of it. I've got the sound. This is a super common one, so I'm sure that somebody can tell me what the name of it is. Chickadee. 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 Yeah, there we go. Um, this is my favorite one to do with kids because it just sounds like they're saying chickadee. You know, chickadee dee dee dee, chickadee dee dee. So, yep, there we go. We got the chickadee. Okay, if you don't know this one, I'll be disappointed. Yeah, give it up. Um, cardinal. Yep, the cardinal. All right, we got the cardinal. We got a pretty song. Okay. Owl. Yep, it's an owl. Do you know which kind? <laughs> this one is the barred owl. Um, this is the one we say it sounds like it's saying, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Uh, that's the easiest way to be able to differentiate them with the uh, great horned owl, because usually when you see them, it's nighttime, and you can't necessarily see if they're, I, I usually don't even see them. I usually just hear them. Um, but the great horned owls have that really low, and, you know, it's a very different sound when you hear the barred owl. Uh, mm -hmm. this one you all know, our, our sign of spring when they show up again, our little friend, the robin. robin. Yep. And then this is one more one that I've been seeing a lot of on my cup plant lately, actually, in the, in the native gardens. Okay. Um. So let's see, I'm just going to go ahead and real quick mute everyone again, if I can do that. Um, mute all. Okay. That will just cut out a little bit of that background noise that was going on. Uh, so I included also some photos of woodpeckers just because it's fun to note that we actually have nine different kinds of woodpeckers that live in Minnesota. And I'm just gonna rapid fire, go through these different woodpeckers. The downy and the hairy are almost identical, except for the fact that the hairy is a little bit bigger than the downy. We've got 
the yellow-bellied sapsucker, which I think is an awesome name, the flicker, the red-headed woodpecker, which is the one I mentioned being a species of greatest conservation need, red-bellied, the pileated, these ones are huge. If you've never seen one, um, you'll be shocked at how big they are. And then two that don't live in this part of Minnesota, but are up north in the bog areas are the three-toed and the black-backed woodpeckers. So that's just some fun trivia for you related to birds. Um, unfortunately, we know that the habitat in the metropolitan area of Minnesota has changed a lot over the past 150 years or so. They did surveys when this part of Minnesota was first settled by Europeans. And um, if you look at this map over on the right hand side, you know, that long skinny area is Washington County. Most of our county was prairie, it was oak openings, there was little patches of big woods uh, along the lakes mostly and a little bit in the river areas. But over time, the vast majority of that habitat has been lost because we've converted into farmland, we've developed homes and businesses and all the places that we live. Uh, the remaining natural habitat, the north end of the county has most of it. And then you can see in the metro area, uh, there's also a lot that's along the river valleys like the Minnesota, Mississippi, St. Croix River Valleys. So this has had a really big impact on water but it also has had an impact on the wildlife like the birds. Um, if you're familiar with an author, Doug Talami, he wrote this landmark book, Bringing Nature Home, a couple of years ago, and he was looking at the declines in bird populations and was able to correlate those with declines in insects. And um, you know that kind of then lined up with decline declining amounts of native plants because the insects have special plants that they'll eat, the birds have special insects they like to eat. And so when we have too many plants in our yard that don't provide food for the insects, then there aren't enough insects to provide food for the birds. Uh, so we, through the conservation district, we do a tree sale every year and we've been trying to ensure that we have good native trees that are good hosts for insects, which the birds eat. And I'm just gonna rapidly go through a few of these. Um, hackberry, nannyberry, pagoda dogwood, this is a good one for the shade. It's a shrub that grows in the shade. Hazelnut, hawthorn. I have this one in my front yard and this, I should take a different picture than this one because it's really beautiful in the fall, it has really beautiful fall color and gets pretty little red berries on it too. Uh, wild plum, red osier dogwood. Black cherry, white pine, red maple, and this is the biggie, the white oak. I think that I read that white oak supports something around 512 species of insects, which sounds creepy, except that means that it's basically like a bird buffet. So um, I just wanted to make sure to talk about the trees first because a lot of times when people think about landscaping for wildlife, they go straight to thinking about the flowers, you know, what's gonna create um, pollinator habitat, but the trees are really, really vitally important as well. So pollinators. Uh, I think everybody knows about monarch butterflies. They're one that we are seeing a lot of right now at this time of the year. And unfortunately, we also are all familiar with the fact that their populations have been really plummeting over the past couple of decades. Uh, so the Eastern monarch population numbers decreased 53% from last year to this year. And you can see on this chart that with the exception of having, you know, this kind of one great year in 1996, it's really been trending down. So this is a big challenge that we are working to address uh, locally across the US and in Mexico where they overwinter. Um, the monarch butterflies of course can only lay their eggs on milkweed and that's what their caterpillars are able to eat. Um, there's a couple of organizations, Monarch Joint Venture and um, the Fish and Wildlife Service that have really extensive resources related to protecting monarchs. So these are two good resources that I would recommend you go to if you're really interested in creating and supporting monarch habitat. Another insect 
that is maybe not quite as charismatic as the monarch, um, but cute and fuzzy, our new state bee, it's called the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, and it was officially designated as a Minnesota state bee last year. Uh, but unfortunately, the reason it was designated as a state bee is that it has been recently added to the list of federally endangered species. And it's one that uh, nests in the ground. It doesn't live in large colonies the way a honeybee does, but it needs blooming native flowers throughout the growing season from April through October, as well as connected high quality habitat. So in the state of Minnesota, we actually have a brand new program now called Lawns to Legumes, which is being operated through the Minnesota State Board of Water and Soil Resources. And they're offering grant funds to help people create uh, pollinator habitat in their property, but specifically to help with the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. Angie? Yes. Excuse me, are you aware that that uh, road redosure dogwood picture is still up oh no i i, I made was... reference to some other things and they were not on the screen so actually oh. i see i see black cherry still it hasn't uh gone forward since that oh really yeah. oh wow yes i'm several slides forward okay well let's find out what's going on let's see if i okay did it stop sharing you see me again okay yes that's correct now it's the let's... gallery yeah see everybody but not the slides oh okay i just reopened do you see a picture yeah. of a prairie with bumblebees yes yes okay. Yes. Yep. okay well i wonder what on earth was going on because it was changing on my end um i wonder if, there, yeah. if my internet's getting spotty okay um well i'm i'm sorry about that i'm not really sure what was going on let's see if i can go backwards just Oh man, so I talked about all sorts of stuff. Are you guys seeing things going backwards as I'm pushing backwards? Yes. Okay, so you see you see butterflies flying. Yep. Okay, yeah. I'll just quickly, quickly go through these just so you don't miss out on getting to see the pretty butterfly pictures or the sad charts of the butterfly populations declining, the cute little caterpillar. Um, I am recording this and I can give a copy of the, a link to a copy of the presentation to Anne to email out also, or I can just email to people directly so that you can grab some of the websites on here that I'm sharing. Uh, and this is the, the picture of our new state B. Um, I think that he is out with Gary. I'm giving a webinar right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I think he and Gary went out. No problem. Um, yep. Can everybody see see the slide with the pictures of the seven different flowers? Yes, the lawns to legumes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Good. Uh, so the lawns to legumes program uh, that I was mentioning, they've developed a whole suite of resources to uh, help people improve pollinator habitat on their property. And they do have grants, they're pretty competitive. We're out of funding for this year, but they're hoping to get new grant funds for another round. Um, but these are just some ideas of some of the native plants that are good nectar for the um, rusty patch bumblebee. So, if you're somebody who likes to, you know, kind of help understand things visually, one of the things that's most important to the Rusty Patch Bumblebee is to have nectar throughout the season, not just at this time of year when everything is blooming. And, you know, this little chart, it's, you know, hard to see the words on it, but it's important to have things in the springtime, you know, like the Virginia bluebells or the Eastern waterleaf, things that are providing nectar in the early spring, as well as in the late fall, like when the asters are blooming, uh, so that they can make it all the way from the beginning to the end of the season. And I also wanted to, you know, point out that there are a lot of bees that live in Minnesota. The honeybees, are not actually native to Minnesota. So a lot of people in Scandia do raise bees. Um, you know, you're probably familiar with beekeepers in your community. 
and um, all of the all of the flowering habitat that we create is great for them. We have the rusty patch bumblebee, but then there are just hundreds of other kinds of bees that are native to Minnesota. And some of them are solitary ones. They don't live in colonies. Um, others of them live in you know, small family groups. But this just gives you an idea of the range of all the different kinds of bees that you might find in your yard if you're planting some of these pollinator species. Uh, so just a few resources for people interested in bees. Um, the Bee Lab at University of Minnesota, Pollinator Friendly Alliance, which is a local citizen-led group, um, the Honeybee Club of Stillwater, that probably any of the beekeepers in your area are um, probably familiar with their members of, and then Xerxes Society. Um, Xerxes has information for conservation of all sorts of insects, not just bees, but um, you know a lot of really good resources for bees. Okay, I'm just gonna pause. Are there any questions before I start talking about turtles and frogs? You can feel free to just unmute yourself if that's the easiest way. All right, then I will move on to turtles and frogs. I, um, turtles and frogs, I bring up because they're kind of one of those um, easiest wildlife to see. You know, it's like, obviously there's bears, there's deer, they're usually fleeting and hard to catch glimpses of. Uh, the turtles and the frogs, you know, they don't move around as much. And so if you've got them on your property, you're a lot more likely to see and find them frequently. I'll play the frog sounds just because I always think it's fun to hear what these different kinds of frogs sound like that live here in Minnesota. Uh, the ones that you might most often find upland in your gardens are the toads. Kind of creepy horror movie sounding sound that they make. Um, let's see, when I was out visiting at Anne's farm on Monday, there was a tree frog that was perched on one of their plants. Sound like. and, you know, a lot of times find them during the summertime too, just kind of like root up against the side of a window or the side of a house. Um, the early spring peepers. Because it sounds like they're peeping. Uh, the wood frog. The wood frog is one that we're finding less of in the metro area because there aren't as many of the flooded woodlands as there used to be. Um, the forest frog is another one that you hear early in the spring. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to how you support frogs, there is a couple of good recommendations. One is to limit the use of chemicals, especially in the spring, because they're amphibians, their skin absorbs chemicals really easily. Um, I also always remind my son, like, if we are out hiking and we've got bug spray on and he's finding frogs, it's like, no, you got to wash your hands first. Like, don't put bug spray on your hands and then pick up frogs because um, they can absorb it through their skin when you're touching them that way. Um, leaving an unmowed buffer near soggy woods and seasonal wetlands, that's where uh, the frogs are most likely to be. I included recommendations for a few different plants that are good for uh, frogs. Sedges, blue flag iris, swamp milkweed, joe pie weed, cardinal flower, black eyed Susans, ferns. Uh, and then again, just remembering to leave a few fallen trees and logs in the water that provide shelter for the frogs. Can you hear the church bells ringing in the background? <laughs> this is one of the joys of living in Stillwater that we have um, church bells ring every 15 minutes all day long, but then at noon they play a long, long song. Uh, so this turtle here is called a Blanding's turtle, and it is a threatened species that is found in northern Washington County. If you're familiar with the Turtle Tunnel Project, that was installed maybe 10 years ago along Highway 4, just south of Big Marine Regional Park, and that was to create safe passage across the road for uh, turtles, like the Blanding's turtle. Um, they're one that can travel, let's see, they can travel up to a mile to lay eggs. And so they're really vulnerable to getting hit by cars. 
and they need really large tracts of um, both upland and wetland habitat in order to be able to survive. So the fun thing that we found after we installed the turtle tunnel, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see, yay, Blanig's turtle. They did use the tunnel. They found it. They're getting across. But there was also all these other uh, animals that discovered the wildlife tunnel and have been using it. So you can see there's a little ferret, there's an opossum, there's a big old snapping turtle. When I was driving up to Scandi on Monday, I had to stop and save a snapping turtle crossing the road on my way up. Um, so I would love to see more projects like this happening around the county where there are these kind of safe wildlife passages created. And just a few more fun turtle pictures to share with you. Um, snapping turtle crossing the road, like I said, painted turtle, that's probably the most common one you see. And then the smooth and spiny soft shell, soft shell turtles. I usually find those out in the St. Croix River. Um, I haven't found them anywhere inland, but that's the most common place you'll find them is on sandbars out in the river. Okay, any other questions on turtles before I start talking about gardening with native plants? All right, so I always start with this picture when I talk about gardening with native plants, just because a lot of people have a preconceived notion in their mind that if you're using native plants, it's gonna look wild and out of control. And uh, obviously it can look wild and out of control. And if you like that, that's great. You can also make it look really intentional and you can mix it up. You can have pastas that aren't native and black eyed Susans that are, and they can all live happily together. You don't have to be a purist. Um, and there were a really nice way to fill in some of those kind of inconvenient spaces on your property. You know, for example, in this picture, this is the area around a mailbox that's probably really hard to mow. Um, nobody's hanging out playing soccer there. So why not put a bunch of native plants there and it creates a pretty backdrop and uh, some good pollinator habitat. We recommend native plants for water quality because they've got the really deep root systems. If you look over on the far left, it's got um, you know Kentucky bluegrass with its like two, three inch deep root system compared with these native prairie plants that might have roots going 10 or 14 feet deep. Um, they're very good at holding the soil in place on steep hills or on lake shores. They do a good job of soaking water into the ground. They'll decompact soil over time. And they're also very drought tolerant, you know, because they can survive a fire, they can survive a drought, and the plants will be able to keep growing. So you won't need to water them as much either, or at all. Um, just some ideas for native plants for different kinds of uh, areas that you might have on your property. Here are some good ones for shady areas. Wild geranium, culver's root, columbine, fox sedge, lady fern, uh, the shade gardens are going to be the ones that bloom early in the year. You're going to find them blooming in May and early June. And by the time you get to this time of year, it's going to be a lot of green. So that's why it's nice to incorporate those sedges and ferns to have some, you know, some pretty structure once you run out of flowers. Um, partial sun to partial shade, just a few options. Culver's root, blue lobelia, turtle head, bottle gentian, and sprinkle sedge. Um, bottle gentian are, I love these just because they're blue, which is pretty unique. Uh, they bloom really late in the fall. They're like late September into October. So there's something that's nice to have blooming when almost everything else is done. Um, but the bumblebees will also go in there. The bumblebee like shakes its body at just the right frequency that it's able to, you know, like the, the flowers on the bottle gentian never open up. They're always like this but the bumblebee is able to kind of like open up and get in there. So sometimes you'll walk by and you'll see the flower just wiggling and then, you know, a bumblebee butt will come out and it will go flying away. Uh, full sun, the world's your oyster when you've got full sun. There's so many different kinds of native plants that grow well. Um, some of the showy ones, the black eyed Susan and the purple cone flower are good favorites. Butterfly milkweed is one that um, is a little shorter, a little less likely to spread than the common milkweed, um, and it grows in dry areas. And I included a picture of this anise hyssop. It's fun, it smells like a licorice. And 
the bumblebees just love it. I have some in my backyard and it's like bumblebee candy. Just a few more options for full sun. Um, the Meadow Blazing Star and Prairie Blazing Star, these ones are ones that the monarch butterflies absolutely love. And the asters are good ones for providing blooms into the late fall. So that's a good option there. Uh, for about 13 years now, we've had a partnership called the Blue Thumb Planting for Clean Water Program. And it's a public-private partnership. So we have nurseries that grow native plants. We have landscaping companies that specialize in working with natives. And then nonprofits and government entities that all work together to promote native gardens, rain gardens, and shoreline, um, stabilizing shoreline with native plants. They have, uh, just back up again, um, the Blue Thumb website has like a plant selector tool that you can use to find the right native plant for your property. There's links to all the retailers, there's guides and how to's and, um, you know, pretty much everything you could need to get started on a project of your own. Uh, just briefly, by now, I assume that almost everybody knows what a rain garden is, but um, we create a lot of these, especially in residential areas where what we're doing is creating just a slightly convex um, rain garden that is able to capture water when it rains. Uh, so that instead of running off and going into a storm drain, it soaks in to the ground or it evaporates. Um, and most of the time, the rain gardens just end up looking like a normal garden, although they're, they're a little bit carved out. If you drive through Stillwater, go down Pine Street, you'll notice little bump outs on every side of Pine Street, and those are rain gardens that have been installed um, partially as like a traffic calming, intentionally traffic calming measure, but like also to catch the storm water that was going to the river. Um, we also work with people on restoring shoreline properties. So this is an example of a home that was on Lake Josephine. And they used to have just lawn all the way down to the shoreline and a lot of erosion along the shoreline and I worked with the Rice Creek Watershed District, got a grant, um, took a portion of that lawn out and put in native flowering plants. So they still have access to their dock, um, but they also have habitat and are helping to control the erosion that way. Um, if you have shoreline property, this is a good way to think about what we'd like the shoreline to look like. Um, having more of the lawn up close to the house and then having mostly natural habitat closer to the water. You can see in this illustration, there's a little area for a beach, a little area for a, um, you know, a pier, but then just a tiny little walkway cut through the vegetation to be able to get down to the water instead of clearing the whole area. Woodlands, there's lots of these in Minnesota. Uh, according to the Forest Service, more than 50% of our freshwater supply in the US comes from forest areas. Uh, but in the St. Croix Basin, we have actually uh, lost 20% of the forests over time. So we are interested in, you know, continuing to maintain the forest and especially, um, you know, maintaining the quality of the forest that we have. The conservation district I mentioned earlier does have a tree sale where every year we sell bundles of trees. Uh, people start ordering around November and then pick them up in the springtime. And I'm also including info, some resources through University of Minnesota and DNR for um, forest management. I'm kind of going rapid fire through some of the some of these last examples here. Uh, Prairie, this is my son Charlie when he was like two years old, out at um, St. Croix Scientific Natural Area, the one that's in Bayport. Uh, the prairie is something that's become really popular in the past 10 years. Uh, we get a lot of calls from people who move out to the country and they've got this little chunk of former farmland that they aren't interested in farming themselves anymore. And so, um, you know, people are starting to take these little parcels that are three, five, 10 acres and convert them into prairie. And this is a photo from one down in Stillwater Township, Nora Olson, who 
when she moved onto this property, she told me this was like her fourth place she'd lived in in Washington County. And she said every single place she went, she had converted whatever was there into prairie. So I guess it's her fourth prairie now. And just some fun prairie photos. Uh, there are really good resources through the DNR. And we also have a staff person, Tara Kelly, who is a prairie specialist. So if you are considering a prairie or know somebody in the community who is, recommend that they talk to her and she'll have really good advice on how to get started. Uh, there are sometimes even grants available if you're converting a large area of lawn to prairie or former cropland to prairie. Um, and wetlands. This is another one that's, that's really important and we've got a lot of in Washington County. Approximately 43% of the threatened and endangered plant and animal species in the U.S. live in wetlands. And um, we have rules that are specifically designed to protect wetlands in, you know, at the federal level and in Minnesota. So basically, um, they prevent draining, filling, or altering a wetland. Um, you have to get a permit for any kind of project that is going to impact a wetland, including driveways, culverts, new construction. Um, our office does most of the wetlands coordination, so we're always a good first step if you're doing something on your property that you think will affect a wetland. Uh, and this is just a pretty picture of a wetland. This is off of um, Hardwood Creek in Hugo. So the most common question that we get related to wetlands is, can I get rid of the weeds and replace it with more attractive vegetation? Um, so we always say, well, first of all, let's make sure it's actually a weed. Um, the second of all, if it's something that is, you know, really aggressive, like the reed canary grass or the purple loosestrife, there are a lot of great options. It's just going to be a lot of hard work. So we can definitely work with you on, um, you know, enhancing some of that wetland habitat if that's something you're interested in. There are different zones. So, um, you know, just because it's a wetland, not all plants grow the same in different regions. This is the same as along a lakeshore area where there's going to be, you know, the higher areas that are mostly dry and the lower areas that are almost always wet and then that kind of in-between area. So, there's different plants that grow, um, you know, well in each of those different regions, but there's all sorts of grasses and rushes, there's sedges, and there's, of course, um, flowers that grow well in the wetlands. Uh, blue flag iris is my favorite. It's just gorgeous. I love that one. Um, but another one that I'm always happy to see around this time of year is the jewelweed. You, you've probably also heard it called touch me not because if you ever stumble into some nettle and you've got that burn, you can take the flower of the jewelweed and just rub it on the burn and it will get rid of it. So that's a good one to know. Um, wetland shrubs also, the uh, you know winterberry, pussy willow, the uh, red osier dogwood. These are different shrubs that all grow well in these wet areas. Okay, so this is um, the, you know, once you're hopefully inspired how you get started. At Washington Conservation District, our staff offers free site visits for any resident in Washington County, whether it's, like I said, somebody who lives in a condo, um, you know, a small house in the middle of downtown Stillwater, a large farm with 100 acres, um, you know, or even a business. So people can just go online and sign up for a site visit. Uh, the watershed districts offer cost share grants for projects like rain gardens and habitat restoration and shoreline plantings. There's a lot of really good resources on the Blue Thumb website. And then um, the thing that I also wanted to mention, put in a plug for the volunteer projects that uh, Anne's daughter Olivia is coordinating. Um, oh, let me scroll forward. There we go. Um, so she is working to improve uh, and create migratory bird habitat in Scandia, Marina, and St. Croix, and May Township, and has volunteer days this Saturday and next Sunday, and is looking for people to sign up to just, you know, come by for a couple hours and plant trees and shrubs, and can 
um, jump on and mention more about that if you want to. Anne? <laughs> um, so if you go to that Sign Up Genius link, um, we can also send it out to everyone who is participating on the call here so that you can sign up and um, either help at Scandia um, or Tonami. Those are the two plantings that we really need help with. And there's something for all skill levels and ability to work from just labeling plants on markers and collecting trash to um, actually shoveling and, and planting plants. Okay. I'm gonna um, go slightly backwards then, um, back to the where to buy plants, just because this is a question that we frequently get asked. Uh, it used to be that my go-to for people in Scandia, I would say, well, just go right on over to Prairie Restorations and they aren't selling out of that facility anymore. Um, it's not too far up the road to get to landscape alternatives off of uh, Highway 95 when you're heading towards Taylor's Falls. Um, but there's a number of other good ones that are relatively close in the St. Croix Valley area. Um, I guess six that I would most frequently direct people to that are within a relatively easy drive of here. Uh, Dragonfly Gardens over in Amory is really great and very affordable. Um, I just put a little asterisk here because they were earlier this year selling Victory Gardens that you could just buy, you know, like a uh, like a pre-planned little um, vegetable garden. So that would be something fun to try next year. Um, Knick Knick Natives, Lupin Gardens also in Amory, um, Outback Nursery down in Denmark Township, and then um, this Native Sun Seeds and Plants is in Afton. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so I can see you all again. Are there questions? Anybody feel free to turn your speakers back on again. Are questions things that I raced through that you want to know more about? Or do you want to share any fun wildlife sightings that you've had recently in your yard? Because that's always fun to hear about too. Hey kids. <laughs> and, Angie, I do have a question. Yeah. We have a, we have a pond. Well, we've got a couple of ponds on our property. But a couple months ago, my um, grandchildren uh, started buying ducks, little baby ducks. Oh, and okay. They're big, they're big ducks now. Okay. But uh, we have them trained where they go from their house in our backyard, and they waddle across our backyard, and they go to one of the ponds. But the pond that they go to, and they don't mind it, but it's got the green um, stuff on top. Oh, what is the green stuff? And it's, it's, it well, it's called duckweed. I'm almost certain that it's filled with duckweed and it's what ducks eat. So that's why they're going oh, there. Okay. Yeah. Um, the way you can them. tell the difference between duckweed and algae, like if you, if you go and look at it up close, it looks like it's a little tiny miniature lily pad. Like you can pick it up on your finger and you'll be able to see just, you know, like itty bitty little green leaves, but yeah, ducks and geese eat it. So that's why they're going there. So it's a good thing. <laughs> We've got them trained. Them. So in the morning, when we let them out of the their kennel, um, we just you know let them eat for a while, and then take yeah. all ducks to the pond, and they just okay. waddle across the whole backyard, and they go down to the pond, and then at night we go down to the pond. All ducks go home, and so they all go back to their little. Oh, that's cages. so cute! Oh, cute! <laughs> I love it. Any other fun? Okay, if it's not the green stuff, either way, they can eat that, right? Yeah, I mean, the algae, I don't think, I don't know that they would eat the algae, but it's not going to, it probably wouldn't bother them. I'm almost certain it's it's duckweed, though, because okay. that's like usually when you look and you see, you know, kind of the, the green all over the top like that, it's usually duckweed. Okay. Yeah. Angie, I have a question about ponds as well. Okay. Um, we have a pond on our property that uh, whose water level varies drastically from year to year. Yeah. And last, last year it rose probably six or seven feet. Yeah. And it turned out 
be a good thing because it killed off all the reed canary grass and thistle that were growing there the oh, year great. before. Okay, so it drowned them out, yeah. <laughs> it drowned those out, but uh, now there's new things coming in. I suspect over time, if it stays dry, it's going to return back to reed canary. So what I was wondering is, yeah, what do you plant along the shoreline of a pond whose, uh, whose water level varies so much? I mean, are, are emergent plants good for that? or? Um, yeah, I think that emergent would be the best because they're the ones that are best adapted to that fluctuation. Uh, yeah, yes, or last year was a very high water level year, and I know that this year there's still some parts of northern Washington County, some of the landlocked areas, landlocked areas are still very high. Uh, so I anticipate that's going to continue to be the case that, you know, we're going to see high water levels probably continue for the next several years, um, you know, just based on the way precipitation trends are going right now. But yeah, I would say emergent, emergent yeah. plants, those are the ones best, best they adapted. Can, and, and getting something in there before it. the reed canary comes back would be great. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's already filled back in with something completely different. Uh, I haven't been able to identify it, but. Okay. I don't like it. It's kind of, it's not, it's, it irritates my skin when I walk through it. Let's put it that way. It, it almost feels like, it's not itch weed, but it feels like. It's, so it's I wonder if it's scaly. the nettle. Okay. It's, it's not nettle. No. It's not it, nettle. Okay. No, it, it's kind of somewhat bushy. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. And okay. you could, I mean, if you just want advice on good, um, Good place. Oh, I'm totally distracted because there's a hummingbird on my Joe Pie weed right now. Um, sorry, I, <laughs> that's the problem with sitting out in the yard. I'm like, ooh, ooh, a squirrel. Um, Pretty good distraction. <laughs> yeah, uh, you could sign up for a site visit and have somebody come out and you know give you some advice on plants to plant. Also, if you're okay. interested in that. All right, thank you much. Yeah, Angie, are we going to get a copy of your uh, PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Yeah, I've got it recording. Um, so. I can share it both ways. I can share it like the slides I actually already have on our website and then the video recording, I can share that too. Great. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Angie, I, I have a question. Yeah. I live on uh, First Lake in Forest Lake. Oh, excellent. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, almost every year, um, the ice pushes our shoreline up, mm -hmm. okay? Yep. And, and I and several neighbors have put rocks out there to try to stop it. But of course, ice is so powerful yes. that um, you can have huge rocks and it'll still move it. Yeah. And I understand, I understand it would be uh, better to have deep rooted grass, grasses there. Mm -hmm. And that would help shore that up. But how do you, how can you possibly get that planted and get it to grow when in fact that would be pushed up? Yeah, I, too? <laughs> I'm familiar with the, the challenges along Forest Lake that those ice heaves have been. Are you on the north side of the lake? I'm on. Uh, probably the Northwest. Yeah, yeah, because I, I know I, I'm, I'm very familiar with the issue there. I mean, it's a problem on big lakes especially, and I think um, one of the things that we suspect is part of the problem on Forest Lake too is that it used to be a forested lake and a lot of the trees have been removed. So, you know, when you kind of had a wall of trees that helped to hold the ice back and doesn't as much anymore. Um, the, the strategy that I have seen people try to do recently is, um, you know, it's a combination of not just planting the native plants, but actually like, like right now, if your property is kind of like this, it's like regrading it. So it's a smoother slope so that hopefully the ice just kind of slides up over the top instead of like hitting the soil and pushing it back, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So yes. I know of some properties where they've, you know, where they've tried doing that kind of, you know, like flattening out and easing the slope. Um, it's hard though, cause so, I mean, I, I know what the shoreline of Forest Lake looks like in a lot of the places it's, you know, it's really steep. So it's hard to get a, a shallow enough rise that the, the ice can kind of glide over it. Um, it seems I, like if you do that, that 
you would lose a lot of shoreline. Oh, if you're, you're, because, if you're trying to if, do the if, play. I mean, if you yeah, get if it you, right, the ice just kind of goes over and disappears, you know, and doesn't take the soil with it. Um, something you but, can do too, though, if you have rocks already in place, you can intersperse native plants into the rocks. So um, there is a technique where they have, you know, like in all kind of those gap spaces between where the big boulders are, like native plants mm -hmm. planted in there. So you still have some habitat value also. Yeah. 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 It's, I, I, I realize it's a, <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> yeah. All right. Other, any other questions or wildlife sightings? Um, just real quick, sorry. We yeah. are actually using this class for my daughter's wildlife hours for 4-H. Oh, wonderful. And I missed the beginning. Do you work at a, the conservation center? I do. I work at Washington Conservation District, and we're a local unit of government serving Washington County, and we provide technical services to the local communities and to help uh, local residents do habitat restoration and protect water resources in the area. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks. We really appreciate all the stuff about the animals and plants. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Okay. I have one sighting in Marina on St. Croix. I'm new to this area and I saw a black butterfly that looked like it had been hand painted yesterday oh. and I looked, I looked it up and apparently it's an eastern a black swallowtail. Black Swallow yeah. Hotel, yeah, which is apparently common, but it was not common to me. I lived in the West my whole life, so it was stunning and I and loved it. And they're huge too. They're, they're so pretty. I've been seeing a lot of those around uh, in the past couple of weeks also. Yeah, it was great. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a fun one. Well, thank you so much everyone for joining. And um, Anne, did you want to do you have your September um, presenter scheduled yet? Did you want to give a shout out for who that is? I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, we do not have um, the date set up yet, um, but the focus next month will be on diabetes. Okay. So we're going to post the information about the date, the time, the speaker on the um, Lions Facebook page, and hopefully people here um, can join us for that one as well. Okay. So. Awesome. Is there any last things you want to say before I close us out? Well, I just want to thank you for your time today and for yeah. launching the Lions Lecture Series. Appreciate all your information, the resources that you shared with everyone today. Yeah, no problem. All right, everyone. Well, it was fun seeing you all. Enjoy the rest of your days. Go outside and go take a walk in the pretty sunshine. Thank you. Right. Thank you, everyone. It was great seeing everybody from Ohio. Yes, thanks, Val. Thanks, Val. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.